Very Professor. Yes. Yesterday you posted something. Can you please um, <clears throat> explain a little bit about the assignment? Uh, yesterday, what I posted or? Yeah, yeah, what you posted. Can you please just a little bit clear about that? Okay. Um, yeah, I will, I'll do that in a second. Let me just uh, talk a bit about the transition the class is in right now and then I'll then I'll go to that and we can do a screen share on that. Um, so here's the plan. Um, you have the you have the book and we will you can read the first part of each chapter, which is about the mythology, but you don't have to. In each chapter, it, it says Zeus the man, you know, it says what kind of a man is this? Poseidon the man, and then it goes through what kind of a child he was, um, adolescence, high school, college, ed higher education, and then just like just like the women, um, and then you have to find examples, just like uh, you did before, one personal and one in the public eye in your or in history, right? The history of your country because a lot of this stuff has the whole life trajectory. And then in that life trajectory, many people go through a huge midlife change. And then later in life, they go through another big change. So, so that, you know, it's interesting. Like you might tell the story of your brother, but that, because so far he seems really like X, but you really don't know. You know, is he going to have a crisis? Is he going to, you know, be really good at, <laughs> at staying in that archetype or what's what's going to happen? So, um, so you have the two examples. Now you don't need to bring any art because we're doing two a day. If you want to bring a work of art, that's great. Um, if we have time, I'm going to read a few poems from Nikita Gill, the great goddesses, because she has poems about all those gods and about their relationships to the goddesses. So I picked out three of them to see if that'll work. Um, so uh, last time I was doing Hesiod's creation story, and I'm going to, I'm going to start this time with those Aristotelian virtues. And I'll start with, okay, let's talk about them in terms of a, a group of women and how they would exercise those virtues. Then let's talk about in terms of women coping with a patriarchy and go through the whole list again, kind of quickly, but just to get a sense of what a radical shift this is. And then think about, go through the whole thing in terms of men's relationship to men. And I don't know, it's just kind of shocking to realize how different these cultures are. And it's kind of a miracle if any marriage works in the first place. Sorry, John Atul, don't mean to say that. <laughs> I don't mean to scare you. <laughs> But if you, but it can help you, like it can help you become better at the marriage when you realize the pressures on him and the pressures on you, both at home and at work and with friends and all that are so different. It's really amazing that people do manage to get along. You just have to, there's no way you can do it very well without thinking about it. That's kind of my thing, right? Hestia says, you should think about it. <laughs> and then the rest of them say, I don't have to think that much, you know? Um, so anyway, we'll do the virtues and vices and then I'll go re, um, remind you of the Hesiod story and take it a little bit further. Then we'll go through that chart of the gods and goddesses. So I'll show you how they relate to each other. And then I'll just summarize what he, what 
uh, she says about Zeus. And then each of you can give your example. And then I'll summarize what she said about Poseidon. And each of you can give your example. And I think we might be out of time, but if we're not, we'll break into breakout groups and you can talk about your second example. Um, and I will go, we'll go to that, we'll do a screen share about the post that I had last time that I put up about how the grading works. And, um, you know, it's, it's, at least it gives you some sense that there are standards there. Um, each, each student is different, has a lot to say. Um, some of them, the English are, are, is worse. So I have to cut grade down somewhat on the English. If I, if I rewrote your post, that's an indication, right? But I just want you how to, to learn how to write better English. So your grades will get better. Um, if to some extent in this class, but certainly over the four years. So it is really important that you're, by the time you graduate, you really have, really have good English. Um, so let me do a screen share. And um, we will, oh, I, sh oh, I hope everybody can see it. Um, all right. Can everybody see it? Yes, Professor. Okay. Yes, Professor. Okay. Can the people at Lyon see it? Yes, yes Professor. Okay. Okay. That's that's <laughs> what I'm looking for. Um, now the next question I have is how to make it bigger. Um, oh boy, I didn't. Okay, can you read it? I can't read it. Um, yes, probably. You can read it all right? Okay, so this is how I grade, right? Um, to some extent, it's the English, uh, but, all right. So, all right. So first of all, you I asked you to give examples of of two people, right? One at home, one in the public eye. Well, some of you gave just one example. Okay, that would be a lower grade. Some gave two and that would be fine, but that's, it's, you know, it's not instantly an A because you had two examples, right? And it's not instantly a B because you had two. It depends upon what else you do with your examples. Somebody has more, right? Then this instructions were one personally, one in the public eye. Okay, so if you have one or if both are personal or if both are public, okay, you know. Uh, one of you I remember gave a reason why she couldn't find one in the public arena, fine. Okay, so I just check that off the check sheet. And then the next thing that's more important if you explain why you made the choice, right? You give a lot of reasons, right? How that person fits the archetype, why you chose it. Well, some students give one reason, some give three reasons, some give five reasons, right? That would be a difference. Um, if your reasoning actually follows the points in the reading, right? Sometimes the, the, your reasons don't fit <laughs> as well, right? Some of them do fit. Okay, so there's a better and worse there. Um, and then with your examples of the artwork, do you have one or do you have two or more? Do you explain why you chose the example? Do you give specific aspects um, of a painting or lines in a poem, how they connect to the archetype? If you bring your own examples or if you use the examples in the book, okay. If you use the examples in the book, did you connect them with the archetype in lots of ways, right? Do you explain what you're thinking? Do you explain it well? Uh, describe what stood out to you about what, uh, okay. Then the next thing, when you have that section where you're describing what you learned from what the other students said, okay. 
somebody says, oh, she said that, and that's it, right? Okay, you liked that she said that. You didn't explain to me why, right? Okay, so you did the assignment, but you didn't do an A. That's not an A, right? If you want an, you know, A means excellent, way over and beyond the assignment, <laughs> right? A C, technically a C is that you did the assignment. Now I'm not, I'm not that hard a grader, but in the division meeting we had, you know, the ethos, the ethos of the school is that we are tough graders, okay? So I have been given, I have been a pretty easy grader. I've given a lot of A's because I like what you say. And that's why, okay, here, this is gonna, this should make a difference in the grades. This is, if you wanna know, why didn't I get an A? Okay, here, <laughs> look at all this stuff. And then you'd go, how could I possibly get an A? Well, you know, it's somewhere in there. That's that's what I'm saying. There are reasons, you know, when I read it. So when you're explaining what you learned from the other students, do you give a lot of reasons? Are they interesting? Do they go over and beyond anything we just said in class? Then in your final reflection for the day, do you add a new insight based on examining everything you've read, heard, and wrote? So um, you're synthesizing it, right? So, um, all right. Um, yeah, I remember when I went to college, I wanted to go to a really good college. I didn't want to get straight A's. I got straight A's in high school. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to learn from people. And I can't learn from people if I'm ahead of them. So I didn't mind getting Bs, you know, because the other students were really smart and they said really cool things. And so I hope that that's your attitude, right? That, uh, and then I know lots of you have obstacles and that might affect your ability to come up with the highest quality work that you could do if you didn't have, you know, if you had time, but I, you know, I have to grade you on what you, what I read. So that's that. Um, if you have any other questions, just do office hours because I don't want to spend class time. How do I get an A basically, <laughs> you know, or why didn't I get an A? It's too exhausting. So that, that should do it. You know, there are a lot of criteria there. Okay, so here's the next thing. Um, here's the virtues. So let's just quickly in your imagination, I guess because of time, I'll just do this um, because I would love to have you chip in. Um, if we were in a room, you could just raise your hand, right? And I would see it, but you know, uh, things, things being as they are, I think I'll just do this myself, but then you can write, I would, I, you need to write some reaction to this. Like what was it that uh, Professor Beck said about the, these different virtues and how they're exercised differently in three different ways of looking at it? Which things that she said really stood out to me and, and, you know, when I, I just got done reading the five students who commented on which, which of those arguments with Sophia and the other goddesses, and in general, what about that stood out to me. And it's very fascinating. Um, so I'll cut and paste that for all of you to read each other's whenever you have time. But yeah, so the students, this is what I want you to get that something will stand out to you. And then the question is, what does that tell you about you? Because other students, that wouldn't have, they wouldn't have thought about that at all. And the same thing happens in life. That's what, it's so important. This is like life. Someone will go to a tail space, you know, they have that wonderful tail space event. Someone will go or you and your girlfriends hopefully will go, some lecture will be given, 
And afterwards, you talk about it. I hope you do. And then each of you got something really different out of it, you know? <laughs> and then you go, wow, this is a learning how to live is a very creative activity. And people don't realize that they are literally creating their intellectual history, their life history in the way that they filter all this stuff, what they go to, what they don't go to, what sticks, what doesn't. Because over time, if they keep filtering things a certain way, that's gonna become their whole way of their worldview. So um, it is nice to talk to other, other students at AUW just so you get some perspective. And instead of arguing about it, you just get, wow, she got that out of it, okay. So what does that tell me about life? What does it tell me about myself? Um, and then especially, you know, if you think one of your sisters is going astray, you can, you know, question her and say, are you sure you really did like that? I thought it was kind of perverted, right? Or uh, anyway, something like that. I, there was a presentation one time, uh, by a woman from Japan or something. And she had some other grad students with her. And she was talking about that as a kid, she went to the international schools, which is for privileged kids. And she fell in love with Jane Austen. She was obsessed. The thing about it, Jane Austen is white Western colonialism. You know, I don't, I don't want you all to be reading all this white Western stuff. I definitely, some of it, obviously my book, but I really want to get you, you know, to read, read your own stuff, read Cambodian women artists and bring in examples from your country and uh, learn more about the arts community in your country and learn more about the history of women in your country. So, and that's what I want to learn about, obviously, because I don't know. So, um, so, I mean, I'm sure I had a very different impression of that lecture than one of the other students, right? If I would have talked to another student, it wouldn't have been good. But my main point is that you're constantly creating your life. Uh, everything you do, every reaction you have, everyone you talk to or don't talk, you know, and the kind of conversation. So that's where the real creativity and the real growing is coming. So as I talk about this, uh, just jot down, right? This is what impressed me and I'm gonna write this in my post. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna ask myself, why did that impress me, right? She said that, oops, that punched a button and I'm gonna have to think later about why, right? You might not, you probably won't be able to think why right now because I'll be at the next point. You don't want to get too distracted. Okay, so in theory, happiness is this flourishing, right? We all have these capacities. They've evolved as um, human culture has gotten more and more complex. Our brains are reacting to this higher level of complexity. We are learning patterns at this higher level had patterns of social interaction. And we're, we're always, uh, consciously or not, we're looking for patterns. Like, uh, for example, among computer geeks, right? I remember, this was years ago, 25, over 25 years ago, there was this little chart in the computer center at my college. And it talked about basically immature men. <laughs> and I don't remember what exactly it said, but it indicated that you can be really geeky and smart in computers and really be emotionally immature. Well, that's Apollo and we'll get to Apollo one of these days. Uh, but that's becoming more and more obvious. Um, the Uber culture, the Silicon Valley culture is notorious for having a frat boy mentality when it comes to women. Um, but any, my point here is that as every step of the way, 
as culture got more complex, we were seeking patterns, right? We're trying to understand these patterns and we're trying to flush out the bad stuff in order to, to be creative and positive, so. Okay, so here we have this natural evolution. Our brains react to the world. They get more complex. They get stimulated in different ways, but we're always seeking flourishing for ourselves and for everybody else. Uh, we're born with this potential. Um, all right, so let's take the group of women. Um, when you talk about temperance, right? Self-control in relation to eating, drinking, and sex. All right. So if you have a group of women, you probably want to start out saying, you may eat whatever you want. We're not going to shame you, right? <laughs> if you, you know, eat more, you know, you don't have to compete for who eats the least. You don't have to compete for who's the skinniest. You can you know, don't be self-conscious about your eating and whether it will attract a male gaze. I hope you understand that, right? That women are just, that's beaten into them in as deep a thing as just trying to feed your, you know, your physical hunger is so socially constructed. So when you're in your group of women friends, uh, <laughs> none of that. And then drinking, of course, lots of you, nobody drinks, and that's great. Uh, <clears throat> but if there is, then there's this, okay, we're not going to shame you if you drink, but you might want to demand drinking in moderation. We don't need to get drunk. Like that's not, the bonding of women is not getting drunk, right? It's drinking in moderation or refraining from drinking. Uh, but let's not emphasize that. And let's certainly not call that fun. Because when you have an alcohol cu culture, women in general suffer because that's when men get uninhibited and, and things can go wrong really badly. So, um, so anyway, there would be a definitely uh, an idea of when women are together uh, the kind of ethos of drinking would be different. Um, then with um, sex, right? We're not going to name and shame. Um, and I would say we're just not going to talk about men, <laughs> right? Maybe so. I mean, maybe a certain part of the conversation, but you don't want to go there. You want to form a culture where women are talking to women about their projects, their goals, what they're doing to achieve it, right? Try to, you know, you try to have one group of friends where you don't talk about men at all. <laughs> at least on Thursday, on Thursday evenings, we meet every week and this is the no, no guys culture, right? Um, so then courage, right? So women have to make sure to, um, you know, show that they can resist pain. They don't have to be the damsel in distress when it comes to physical pain or illness. They can be tough, um, but they also support each other, right? If they're hurting physically, then there's all the mental courage that women have to have, the courage to say no, the courage to be ambitious, the courage to risk, um, losing status, the courage to risk gossip. So there's all sorts of ways women have to be courageous that men don't have to be, right? There's this because of patriarchy. So you encourage each other there. Generosity, I think the thing that stood out was all those women you told me about who suffered something and then started an NGO. And in their NGO, it was like helping young girls deal with adolescence and um, maybe menstruation or, you know, just sex ed. Um, but that in your NGO, you're forming this female culture and, and getting them away from men for a while so that they can have their own identity. Um, then there's the, some of the women who make it big 
um, who then give back. And many of you have stories of that, which I think is great. And there's enough of them at this point. So you can think about they were the pioneers who nobody else did it, they did it. And now there's enough and you all have enough stories uh, in all of your countries. And then I'm, you know, the book I'm putting together brings together a number of them and that will grow. And you just, you know, have a goal of having stories of women being generous and magnanimous um, become a whole sub subculture. Even temperedness, this we went through, right? That we legitimize women's anger when it's when it's fair and we let each other be angry when it's appropriate. We don't shame women, right? Um, yeah, the shaming thing. I mean, you have to have a women's culture that doesn't involve the way women get shamed so much in a patriarchy. Um, rational ambition that you encourage women to achieve at their level. And one of the five students posts uh, really that that's stood out to them. Rational pride, that they take pride in their accomplishments, that they know they deserve to be honored more than they probably are. But in within this female culture, we honor them. Um, humor, another student um, commented on the humor thing. Um, and then friendships are really, really important. Um, and they're based on the pursuit of flourishing, that each of you wants to flourish and you help each other flourish. Um, then you could debate things like how many, how many patriarch, how many sexist put downs are you gonna put up with, right? And you say, you know, uh, <laughs> and then you, you know, you could talk about that. I was in a conversation and I felt like this comment, snide remark, should I just write it off? And it just helps to have someone to talk to that knows they live in the universe that you live in and you're not getting gaslit. I like the expression gaslighting, you know, or somebody does it. Oh no, I didn't do that. Or I didn't mean that. Just, forget it. Okay. Truthfulness that you come to know yourself a lot better. Um, because this is honest, people are being a lot more honest. They're not playing games. Um, so politics, how about economics? How are you gonna deal with economics? Um, how are you gonna make sure to prioritize so that you can get an education so that you can, um, you know, do whatever is necessary to get your foot in the door? Um, uh, don't spend money, right, on makeup and all that stuff and impoverish yourself so you can't, like, go to school and buy the extra, you know, notebook or whatever to uh, achieve at a higher level. Um, legislation. So this is, this is um, what I think is pretty sad right now. There are women in the Senate, for example. And it just turns out everything is so partisan that if their party has a has a, a doctrine or puts pressure on everybody to vote in ways that really don't help women, the women in the Senate with that party have to vote that way or they lose their, their job. <laughs> They'll lose the next election. And so far, they go along with it, which is disappointing. You know, I do think it eventually somebody's got to just say no. And I don't care if I don't get reelected. Like there's some things are more important than that, than just getting reelected. I'll get a different job. Um, there is one political party that actually in the interview, uh, in all the interviews for if you're running for office, they ask you, do you have another job? you could take because we don't want you to um, have, literally have to vote a certain way just to keep your job. We want you to have integrity and to vote your conscience. So do you have another job you could have? And that that's really important to one of the political parties. It's not important to the other one. 
As a matter of fact, the other one tends to find people who don't have any other options because then they will follow the party line. And so you have to think in your country if that's true. It didn't used to be as true as it is now. Um, how is wealth distributed? This is important. Like women, when women are talking to women, they, you know, how is it that women don't get the resources that men get? Or how am I going to find a way to get those resources? Or if I have a position of authority in a company or in a, in a political sphere, but there's lots of other spheres. You could be in the Student Government Association and they have to decide how to distribute resources, right? So all of you could be taking on leadership positions or you could be, um, even if you don't, like I don't, I don't, I'm not good at that, but I can, I'm good at talking about what's going on. Why are they doing it? Do I think it's a good decision or not? And why? So you just basically learn about what good leadership is by following it um, and discussing it, uh, punishing people. Are women punished unequal uh, differently than men? Sometimes men are punished more. So, um, so that can get complicated. Um, but when women are talking to women, that's, that would be examples of if women diss other women, right? If women are more critical of other women, if they compete against other women in ways that harm the community. So that those can be literally political, but they can be all sorts of subgroups that you're in where all this dynamic, all this kind of stuff goes on, all these decisions are made. Um, knowing how to apply the laws to particular cases so um, so women, like, what do you do if a woman had a, her parents forced her to get married and the guy was very abusive. So finally she fought back and killed him, you know, or wounded him. So uh, what kind, yeah, does she get, you know, capital punishment for that or are the, does the judge, is he more lenient? I'm sure these kinds of cases come up or they will start coming up more often in developing countries. Um, then uh, just that uh, these other capacities like women artists, right? The arts. So this is where in a group of women, you would talk about women's art. Maybe you during your group, you would actually bring your some of your favorite artwork by women and explain what it is they're feeling or expressing that you like. Um, let's see, and then, or women are creating solar panels or they're creating, um, I mean, they can be creating anything and selling it on the market. That's interesting, that acknowledges the reality of women's lives. Um, I read somewhere about uh, a woman nonprofit making uh, menstrual pads that were washable because poor women cannot afford to keep buying them, right? So that's really important. <laughs> just stuff like that, where you just take it from a woman's point of view. Um, and then let's see. The intellectual virtues, then you have the math, the science, the all that stuff you learn in college in other classes, the social sciences, and how you how you can talk about if there's a bias, right? Um, and then encourage each other to try and achieve in those areas because that's where the jobs are. But if it's not natural to you. So for some women, it is natural. They liked science since they were young, for others not. Okay, so then you can go through the whole thing again about, so the first time is just women talking to women. The second time is women dealing with patriarchy, right? You could even try an experiment uh, where on Tuesday nights you say, 
don't talk about men on Thursday nights. That's all we talk about is how you're coping with various degrees of oppression, right? So then that would be, you know, how do you deal with a double standard in eating, drinking, sex, uh, courage? Is the, is the guy want to see you as a damsel in distress and he's going to be the hero and protect you and save you? Don't go there because that will be an unequal relationship the rest of your life. That's not you don't want to do that <laughs> because that'll, in his mind, you can't be an equal because he's going to be the hero and he can get, you know, that's just as much of a trap for the guy. It's just not healthy. Um, and then you can, you know, you do want to talk to other women about how you got criticized by guys for this or that, how they don't like that you're ahead of them in class or whatever. So that's a whole different realm of just dealing with patriarchy. Um, and so, yeah, it would be like, okay, I got mad at a guy and he just really couldn't take it. <laughs> Something like that. So you, these would be examples where you're interacting with men and you're trying to cope with your situation and you can talk to each other about it because it's, it's, a whole different realm than how you can relate to other women. So ambition, uh, pride, right? Do the guys just pat each other on the back for success and uh, don't recognize you and what you're doing or how does that work? Humor, can they tell jokes that you can't tell? You know, you couldn't tell dirty jokes and they can. Uh, friendships, what kind of friendships? do you have with men? Are they healthy friendships? And that's really important. Do you think of men more as friends? Or do you always think of them? Is there always kind of a sexual um, innuendo going on? Sociability, how do you socialize with men in a way that's going to try to be egalitarian? And you can talk to other women about whether you succeeded or failed. <laughs> Okay, then you have the political virtues. Um, if you're in, you know, student government association, if you're in various clubs with other guys, um, how is the relationship? Um, it doesn't have to be sexist, right? It's just that the main point here is that it's a whole different dynamic. It could be equal, but it's, you know, it's different then the kind of equality you can get just with women talking to women. Um, if you're making policies, if you're in a leadership position and you're working with other guys on this, how does that work out? Um, so that would be that. And then how do you compete in a co-ed sort of situation? How does, what's different between school at AUW or school in a class with all women and um, a mixed class. So then the third one, then the next round is what we're talking about now, which is relationships between fathers and sons, relationships between brothers, relationships that men, men's kinds of friendships. And, you know, it's sad. <laughs> because patriarchy really wounds everybody, right? These, the stories I, about Zeus and Poseidon, um, well, you know, both of them mistreated women pretty horribly, but they also can't get along with men. They can't, they are just, can't have meaningful relationships and that's very damaging. Um, so it, it is complicated. And um, I think that I'll maybe if I have time, I'll come back to this, but we'll go, we'll move forward and we'll talk specifically about Zeus and specifically about Poseidon. And then we can go back to this chart again and see that they too have to deal with all these same issues. But to what extent is it, um, is it different because you're a man? Okay. 
I mean, one thing about patriarchy is that on the one hand, the doors will open for you if you want to be powerful and wealthy and honored, that it's easier to open the door. On the other hand, if you're a kind of man that doesn't want that, you can get dissed, right? You can get criticized a lot more easily than a woman who's not ambitious, right? So patriarchy wounds all the men who don't fit the type. And then even the men who are naturally like Zeus or naturally like Apollo, they get forced to be an extreme case and they keep getting pushed in that direction. And some, even if they're willing to go, they get way out of balance and they lose, lose any emotional relationships, right? Their marriage, their kids, they get alienated from people um, and their friends, everything is just a strategizing. Um, and then with Poseidon, he also gets left alone in midlife, like nobody, there's nobody there anymore. And that's some men in midlife, some of these men rethink and they decide they really do want to relate to somebody and others don't. So, um, so everybody gets pushed and pulled in a lot of directions, uh, but it's definitely two different worlds, just, you know, not based on your intellectual ability, not based on your real ability to function out there in the public realm, but just because of your gender. And the same is true with race. It, it's really unnatural. So it's been a very unhealthy way to structure a society. Um, okay, so that's the virtues. Then I was going to go back to, um, let's see, whoops. I was gonna go back to Hesiod where I left off. Here we go. Oh my goodness. Okay, all right, so I just talked about, you can reflect on how important is your culture's creation story. If you are Muslim or Christian, how important is that, the Adam and Eve story? Because for other people, it means absolutely nothing. And so how much has your brain got structured by that? And you should think about it because you might not like that woman as temptress and stuff like that. Um, and then in, if you're Hindu or Buddhist, how much of the Hindu Buddhism was really emphasizing that it's just energy, it's not male or female, or how much of that had been sort of co-opted by patriarchy. Um, then the goal is that you would be this Zeus character. And again, he see it was extremely sexist. He hated women. So he has these insights, but, and he worries about men. He is trying to criticize men in the works and days. He's talking to his little brother and saying, don't be lazy, don't be a jerk, don't be this. You know, men are pretty rotten. Men do this and that men need to do this, but women are even worse, right? <laughs> so I think in his mind, his story is educating men and telling them, don't do this, don't do that. You'll be tempted. You'll be a power hungry SOB. Don't treat your son like that. Um, but, and so the goal is that you would be this guy, Zeus, the king on the top of the hill, People would come to you with all your pro all their problems. You would have listened to all my stories and all the whole mythological tradition. You would be able to spot the pattern. Oh my gosh, this is a Poseidon guy. And now his wife is complaining and I have to figure out how am I gonna make a judgment? How am I gonna reason with this kind of person? Um, so, he just, that's what he see it's trying to do. He's focused on men and trying to prevent them from doing something nasty.
by telling a story about men doing really nasty things and it didn't work out very well. <laughs> so don't do it. Um, and Zeus is listening to the muses tell these stories, but he's not doing any of those things. He understands those things, but he does not do them because he loves justice. So this is the kind of person you ultimately want to be. Um, okay. So at the beginning, there's chaos and then eros, creativity, and thanatos, destruction. And they all it all plays out, the drama on Gaia, on the earth. Um, and so he's talking about evolution of nature and of culture. Um, let's see. Then there are nine muses, the muses of music, dance. And think about this. When you muse about something, it's when you're emotionally, you're right, you listen to music, right? Or, and, and you know how when you do that, you just forget about everything else. And that's what muse is, is that it's your imagination's caught up, your emotions are caught up, your mind is freed from all that res, uh, reasoning and logic and all that stuff. And you're just um, living in, a, in an alternative space. Um, and the thing about the muses is that in Hesiod, they, they listen to the, to the flute of Apollo. So you're, you are linking the muse to reasoning, but it's just like, I think I said this, my granddaughter loves to dance. She told her daddy, she's in first grade, dance is my passion. I was like, okay. And she is, she is good. She's very coordinated and she's very performance oriented. She's, she loves to perform. And uh, yeah, she was in a dance class and I'm telling you, she was way ahead of the other kids. She, not only did she get the steps right, but she stares at the audience and smiles and does everything she's supposed to do. So she kind of gets it, you know? But anyway, she has to go from that to creating a dance, right? Creating a dance means you have a beginning, a middle and end, you have, you know, steps to do. So there's a lot of organization there, but you have to have the passion and you tie it to your body. So you basically are thinking about, you know, it, it gri grips your imagination, it grips your whole, uh, your whole body in a very holistic way. But then you have to get the stuff in order. So that's true of all the muses, music, dance, uh, poetry that acknowledges uh, a higher power. So this is the, um, the Quran is very poetic. But most religious traditions, their holy books are very poetic. Um, the erotic poetry, because you're trying to become a little more self-conscious about sexual attraction. Like you want to, you, you don't want to repress it, you want to express it. And then, um, especially the, the myths tell these um, stories of rape because they want you to admit to yourself, yeah, there's a lot of sexual aggression inside of me and I fantasize about this, but I don't, I don't wanna do it. It hurts people. And so I don't want to do it. So I can flush out that desire and be more creative. So instead of fantasizing about raping this, this woman, uh, why don't I talk to her and get to know her, right? Something creative, not destructive. Um, comedy is a way to get perspective, tragedy. And I did talk about all of that. You want to fall in love with the universe as you study it. You want to respect it. You don't want to abuse it, manipulate it. Um, okay. So um, I did talk about um, Gaia, and then she gave birth to Uranus, sky, earth and sky, doesn't change, it's a cycle. Then they give birth to mountains and earthquakes, excuse me, and a lot of changes on the earth. 
So then, um, so then what one of their children is named Kronos, time, because now the earth has a history. There's a before that earthquake and after that earthquake, before that volcano and after, before that mountain range and after. So that would naturally give birth to time. And so the story he see it tells is that Uranus doesn't want to give up his power, right? So Kronos has to kill him. And so that's, or cut off his genitals. But that's the story when Bolin is talking about this relationship between fathers and sons. And, you know, when fathers try to make their sons into a chip off the old block and you will do what I say and you will carry on the family legacy and you will take over the family business or if, and it, she does talk about this, right? If his son is too smart, smarter than him, has more opportunity, what does he do? Like either he can compete against the kid because his ego is wounded or he gets his ego caught up with the kid and the kid can is never good enough. And one of the examples the student read, uh, wrote was she knows somebody like that. She has a friend like that. He, he wins all these honors that his father never had opportunity and his father's still on his case. And it's just really sad. But, but, you know, it is important for women to recognize that the men they know could be under kinds of pressure that aren't the kinds of pressure women are under, right? There's different ways that people really abuse each other. And some of those ways run along the lines of patriarchy. Um, not all of them because there's class issues, there's race issues. So, and then it compounds well, intersectionality. But in this class, I'm just doing uh, gender, but I, I have thought a lot about race and I thought mostly class, class is just a horrible divider. Um, and women can be very guilty of that. Um, so women can really get it wrong when it comes to class, but not this time. I just hope I don't sound like a raving feminist, like I hate men. I don't, it's just for this class, I have to get into this mindset um, and I can, <laughs> that, but I, it's not my whole life. Okay, so, um, okay, so then, okay, so Uranus gave birth to these monsters, right? And so I have this poem. Um, where, okay, so in this poem, um, oh, all right, so Uranus gave birth to these monsters and he was threatened by them and he buried them in the earth and Gaia is really mad. So she makes a sickle, Cronus, she says, who's gonna cut off his genitals, which means his passion and his power and his way of, you know, uh, being boss, right? You cut off somebody's eros, you've cut off, <laughs> they can't do anything. So Kronos cuts off his genitals, throws it in the sea. Um, and then when Kronos has children, Kronos is paranoid that his kids are gonna rebel. And so he eats his children, <laughs> right? And so every one of these generations the father overpowers, the son overpowers his father. And when he becomes a father, he's paranoid about his son. So these these awful power struggles. And I've talked to students. I mean, I had a male student who just told me that flat out. You know, he said, I rebelled against my dad. And he's already, when he's 20 years old, he's anticipating his son rebelling against him. It's, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'd hate to be that kid, that poor kid. Um, but anyway, so this is, 
this uh, poem is about Gaia uh, teaches Ray, that's Kronos's wife. Gaia teaches Ray retribution, right? So Ray is very angry about this. She doesn't want to have him eating the children, right? Psychologically wounding them. So what she does, she goes to Uranus and says, do you want to help me? <laughs> and, and of course, Uranus says, sure, anything to get back at that horrible guy, son. <laughs> so then she wraps up. So when Zeus is born, she wraps up a stone in a blanket. And so he eats, he, he devours the stone instead. And Zeus goes to a cave in Crete and he gets raised there. And so the poem is about the story it says, <clears throat> so Gaia is teaching Ray about fighting back. Mothers are not meant to have a favorite child, but Ray was Gaia's favorite. She saw herself in Ray. She knew what it was like to be underestimated. They were both quiet nurturers, kind givers, yet their own family took their generosity for weakness and often saw their softness as their disadvantage. No one believed Gaia or Ray were capable of destruction, of vengeance, which is why even their own husbands took them for granted. If you practice brutality on a kind woman long enough, you force them to work with their crueler instincts to survive, and mothers can become lionesses to keep their cubs alive. This is how the earth found a way to bring the sky to his knees, practice patience and use that time uh, she hoarded as a key. Styled as a scythe, right, the, the blade, she gave it to her own son Kronos to carve away Uranus's godhood. And when Kronos became power mad and devoured his own children, she did what any good mother would do. She taught Ray the same trick to teach her child devouring husband a lesson. Over cups of ambrosia, Gaia taught her daughter guile, trickery, the theft of patience, how to turn her own softness, his underestimation into an instrument. No one would expect obedient, quiet Ray to be the downfall of her husband, that she would have the wit to manipulate prophecies, have the cunning to hide her last son Zeus, then shape him into the blade that would slash his father's belly, free his siblings, avenge his mother, remind him that without love for his family, he's no king or titan. What they did not know was they would set into motion a 10,000 year war between the gods in their quest for revenge and retribution. How each would lose children and grandchildren in this power struggle they had started. There's a lesson here, a lesson about retribution. They forgot there's always a caveat, a whispered addendum. Even the heavens are not exempt from the violence which will visit if they are disrupt the natural order by ripping a child from their mother. Even God should know better than to challenge that kind of ancient wisdom. For there's nothing but ruin in store for deities and mortals alike when they dare trespass upon the unconditional love of a mother. So yes, <laughs> I hope I hope you get that and like that. Um, yeah, and I do want, I mean, I'm divorced, but my ex-husband was a really good dad. It's interesting because he could be a really good dad and not be a good husband. And those things happen. And the wife, that matters more to me. It matters more to me that he's been a good dad than, you know, what he did to me, which wasn't that bad. Don't worry. No affairs, no violence. Just, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, all right, so let's go to the next thing, is that after that, Zeus becomes king, 
right? And he, um, he, let's see, let's go. This is, this is what starts the chapter that you read. And I think I'll have time maybe next time to go over some of his affairs. Um, but let's see, maybe just for a minute. His first wife, Metis, had good judgment, but then he was, he was worried that she would have a kid that would be more just and wise than him. So he played this game. They turned into different animals. She turned into a fly. He ate her. Okay. Well, she was pregnant. And so then he got this terrible headache. <laughs> and Hephaestus, the god of the forge, cracked his forehead open. And there comes Athena. Um, what is that myth about, right? It's about the fact that Athena, if you remember, doesn't remember she had a mother. She's so male identified. And that, so that story is about a male identified woman because she doesn't, she never knew her mother. She thinks she came full blown from the forehead of Zeus and she didn't. <laughs> but anyway, she did grow up to be wiser and more just than her father. And, um, and she didn't try to overpower him, however, but she wanted him to listen to her, right? Dad, you must listen to me. Don't get so angry and stop chasing women. <laughs> of course, he doesn't listen to her, but she is wiser than him. Um, but look at all those things he did to avoid having a child who is the competition. Um, again, that that's scary to me. I don't know how many of my students have to endure that kind of uh, wounding, uh, but I feel for them. Again, I didn't, I didn't have that experience. Nothing like these stories, but I know some of my students have. Um, so then there was um, Persephone, and I told that story. Then Zeus and the Muses, um, and memory, Zeus and memory. So all of the Muses, all the stories and the dances are related to justice, teaching people how to have a common humanity, teaching their common passions, their common stories, so that they learn how to have justice tempered with mercy, so that they can get along, so that they can make good laws and institutions that will encourage each other to flourish. Um, okay, so the muses are the offspring of memory and justice but they dance, they sing, they dance, they create to the sound of Apollo's um, flute, which I think is really interesting image. Um, then Leto gave birth to Leto and Apollo, and I'll do that when we do Apollo. Um, Hermes, I'll talk about those when we get there. Um, Hera is the goddess of honor. And she has a son who's the god of war, which is how men get honor. Um, now it's the economic war. And then Hephaestus. Um, so, and I will talk more about Hephaestus when we get to, um, to that. Let's see, and there's Apollo. So, so let's go the next one to, um, Oh, to the chart. Let's see. Now the chart is here. Um, okay. Can people see this chart? So Rossi, can you see the chart? Yes, Professor. Okay. Now, what about an American student at Lyon? Can you see the chart? Yes, ma'am. I see a slide that says Olympian deities. Yeah, okay, that's it. Just wanna make sure everybody, cause I somehow I've had experiences where students see the written stuff and they don't see the PowerPoints, but I, I don't know. Anyway, okay, so here we go. There's Zeus, so my, my, the way I teach this is that there are these spiritual, these goals, 
justice, honor, truth. All these things are living for the sake of something higher than yourself. And they have a male and a female counterpart. So justice is the God, is the male God of, and then Athena is the goddess of justice and war, only just war. So she has her little half brother, Ares, who loves war. He just goes and uh, kills people on both sides. He has a double-sided sword. So he's very aggressive. And Athena says, stop, stop. Only war for the right reason. Only if, kill if you have to, minimal damage. So she's always trying to get her little brother, her little stepbrother to stop it. Um, and here's Poseidon, the god of the sea. Whoops. Um, and then his counterpart, the way I understand it, again, you know, everybody's got their view, is Demeter, the goddess of fertility, because earth and the, those are the forces that you better respect, because they can come back at you. You know, the sky can't, but Poseidon can. He can control the winds and the sea and all sorts of stuff. He can flood you out. Um, he can, you know, prevent the wind from blowing and you're, you're trapped if you're on a ship. And the Greeks, you know, ships were important. So, so you have Poseidon, the god of the sea, and you have to respect him or you're in trouble. And then you have to respect Demeter, the god of the earth and fertility or you're in trouble. And we're in trouble, <laughs> right? We've got hurricanes and floods and droughts and uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, loss of fertility of the land. Uh, Hades is one of the ones we cover next time. Persephone, um, Apollo, and then his twin sister is Artemis. Uh, he is basically the, the ruler of cities. So Apollonian reasoning leads to all sorts of things that uh, construction of the buildings in the cities, the sciences, the math, all that sophisticated stuff that takes place in a city. Um, Artemis is the, the wilderness. She couldn't care less about his old city. Um, Ares is the god of war and Hera is, is they're both concerned with honor. Um, and then Aphrodite, oops, sorry, Ares, then Dionysus is the god of wine and the theater, and he's sensuous. And um, Aphrodite is also sensuous. So it's a male and a female. How they get treated, how they act, you know, is gendered. Um, Hephaestus is the god of the forge. He was actually married to Aphrodite. And so there are a lot of stories there I'll get to. Hestia is is the goddess of the hearth, you know that, and then her counterpart is Hermes, because he has a torch, and so he he delivers it from, from Hestia's um, hearth up there on Olympus, uh, and he delivers the messages from Zeus down to human beings, so that's his counterpart. Um, so I think, you know, I like, I like those ideas, those stories, I think they're pretty interesting. Um, all right, so now let's do Zeus. Oh boy. Um, all right, so I, I'm just gonna read this because I just took notes on it and we might not get to, um, to Poseidon this time, but that's all right. We can get to it next time. All right, so Zeus, it said, ever since he's a little kid, um, I can do an outline of this if you want, but mostly just picture in your head. He was pretty willful. He was um, extroverted. He would be positive unless he has some, you know, unless his parents confront him too much. So, so he can be, you know, if you, you just let him be himself, you know, and, and he, she says, if a parent, instead of making everything into a power struggle, I don't want it, I want it, let's do this, let's do that. Just go, okay, okay, little Zeus, uh, what do you want? Do you want this for dinner or you want that for dinner? Which one, 
right? And then he can focus on, he has power, he makes a decision, fine. Instead of you're having that, no, I'm not. You know, I mean, why create struggles? This is the kind of child this is. Um, so the worst kind of parents for him to have are a mother who's intimidated by him. And I have been in like groups. I couldn't believe it. I've been in groups where people are talking about parenting, support groups. Oh my God, there's women who are intimidated by five-year-olds, right? <laughs> yeah, this one woman, this five-year-old just to get back at her broke a family heirloom and she couldn't even, yeah. Anyway, that's bad, right? So if you have this kind of a kid, the worst thing is the mom is intimidated and the father is just butt, butt heads with them from age two, you know, it's silly. Um, the best thing, uh, well, then the other kind of thing that happens is if he has a dad who's successful, but never home, but a mom who's very nurturing, well, then he grows up thinking he's entitled, right? Because she says she loves him and you're going to be take over daddy's company. It's going to be great. And so he just thinks he's entitled to that power, even if he doesn't study, right? Even if he doesn't practice, even if he doesn't have any of the skills. And there's plenty of people like that. Um, so that's the worst for society to have these kids who uh, inherit family stuff and they're not emotionally uh, merciful toward the people they work with and they're not um, and they're not competent and they won't admit it. Their parents have let them get deluded and their father wants them. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. He's a pragmatist starting in high school and you know, you're, you all are old enough to know what you had different personality types in high school. He's not an idealist. He likes to lead. Everything is a strategy. Um, when he's good, when he's good at it, he minimizes the power struggles and just does everything he needs to do to get ahead. Um, he, ever since he had a job in high school, He's always thinking about what he would do to run the company differently. He's always networking with people. He's always thinking ahead to how he can move forward. Um, in his marriage, he's a strategist. He'll strategize about who he should marry, how to, he'll use his marriage to move up. Um, and he tends to have expectations for his wife. She plays a role. Um, he belongs to these clubs, well, fraternities and other sort of clubs for rich guys or wannabe rich guys. Um, he, in sexuality, he tends to be promiscuous, to have lots of children with different mothers. He might have serial families, or he might just have a, a, what, a mistress. Um, he has no emotional intim intimacy. He's not good at um, becoming intimate in relating to women in a, in a meaningful way. Um, he marries up, he thinks of his family as a dynasty and he wants to mold his kids. He'll send them to the best schools, but he wants them to carry on the family legacy. Um, so in midlife, right? He works all this stuff, got all it, it planned. In midlife, he thinks, right? Um, he might think, I never got what I deserved. I never got what I want, get depressed for that reason. He might think, um, I have gotten all this stuff, but I don't want it anymore. Like, I'm tired of this. Um, his wife may leave him and his children might get into trouble because it's a cry for help. He's never been home. He doesn't care about them. Um, and then he finds he has no relationships with people, he's just really alone. He's powerful, he can go to work and he's the boss, but he, he has nothing at home. Um, and some of them just do all right. They'll go marry another nymph and start all over again and not think about it. Others will just join these clubs where they hang out with other men, but it's not meaningful. And some of them will actually really change. 
Um, so later in life, he'll either try to cling to power like Uranus did and Kronos did, try to control his kids or anything, his business. He doesn't let the business go. I had some colleagues. I had a colleague who started a Olympic center for Greek philosophy and culture. And it was time for him to pass it down and he didn't. And he accused everyone of trying to have a coup and it just ruined the organization. So he has died and the organization died with him. Uh, very shocking. Um, he might wanna control his children um, or he'll let go, right? And just let his children be what they are. His um, psychological difficulties is that he sees the big picture, but he doesn't see the individual people involved. Uh, yeah, here's a good example. He's a child rearing expert that never spent 24 hours taking care of a child. And I know that because I remember listening to these guys or reading this and, and when I had a little kid and going, that guy never took care of a little kid. <laughs> you can tell because he never talks about the emotional strain anyway. So that would be an example. Um, he tends to think, though, in worst case, might makes right. Uh, he fears being overthrown. He thinks everyone's out to get him because all he thinks about is power. He gets an inflated sense of himself. If he thinks he's better and more in control, he can easily get manipulated by other people because they will just feed his ego and tell him stuff and not do it and he won't notice. Uh, he might have a heart attack, literal heart attack, um, or he might actually, you know, change. Now, I want you to give me examples. Uh, everybody, let's see. Poppy, could you think of an example? Okay, Claire, can you think of one? Um, yeah, I had a personal example. It was actually one of my friends growing up, her dad. He was always very, um, he craved to have all of the authority, didn't really want to share it with his wife, definitely wanted to feel power, whether it be um, just kind of getting a fear factor out of his children and their friends and his wife even, which I think is crazy, but he worked off a lot of the time. And I still sense that like his family, like even though that he was distant it physically and emotionally, they still felt his authority. They were like on edge about it. So I felt like it, he was just craving power in the way that Zeus does and also not having that emotional connection, but having all of the authority. Are they still married? They are actually. Okay, okay. It's always okay. been a strange dynamic to see from okay. the outside for sure. It's good though to know that the pattern is really there. Uh, there is a name for it. Okay, Louis, what did you come up with something? Yeah, I come up with a personal example. I think it's kind of the, the same with the example of Claire as a, about my father. Um, I am um, in Vietnamese uh, family structure. Like father as a, they, they, they intend to think that father as a provider and mother as a caretaker. And my father is the one he's really like follows the, this uh, structure. Um, he's, he always want to become the one who has highest authority in the family. Uh, he think that a good father is the one who work hard to provide a financial need for the family. And whenever he come home, like he make sure that <clears throat> Uh, he maintained the disciplines in the family. He set rules. He he tell us that we have to do that. We have to do that. If not, we have to receive the punishment. Um, he also set many expectation for us, like especially for my two older brothers. Whenever they have 
been to they, they have to make a decision or simply it's just our way to our way of life in every day it has to be like in his way um so i think like at consequently we don't have much emotional connection with him like we have emotional distance so we don't share uh we don't share with each other uh much like with my mother yeah so that's in my example okay good um may have you got something i think that i see this archetype in like almost every male adult around me <laughs> like even like it's just not one example i see the example like everywhere like even in my family relatives or like um about the neighbor around me i think that in my country vietnam like um usually women are just considered like the housewife and like the caretaker kind of stuff but about men they um they are usually like i don't know like they consider themselves like um superior and often like they assume that we like as women we just need to like stay in house and like kind of care about household stuff kind of like that and about men they can go out they can do everything and uh women we need to like serve them as men kind of like that i think it's kind of a sad thing because i saw that um situation when i was more and even now after more than 20 years i grow up and i still see that situation being there in the new generation of men in my house and in the neighborhood and every and nearly everywhere i i am here in vietnam so i think it's a kind of sad stuff so i think that's why i really want to like go to aw and have a kind of strong community of women because i feel that when women are educated and kind of support each other, um, there will be a lot of changes um, that will occur in the future. Yes, so that's my story. Yeah, that's really good because I hope that when you, you know, taking this class and telling the story of the virtues with women versus what you grew up with, you know how radically different your future will be, but you need to know how psychologically painful that will be right it's going to be a lot of psychological work and so that might surprise you right I, I don't know i mean i know for me the hardest thing for me to deal with was the collective unconscious was all this stuff that was going on that i wasn't aware of and most other people are not aware of it but at least you're aware of it and then the question is how much you know have you internalized how difficult will it be to sort of change that stuff that's been buried but i do think at this point you're really lucky because you know right there's you're in a different space you just don't know how much pull that other stuff has and you'll have to think about it and hopefully talk to other women about it that helps a lot too okay madeline what do you have so while I was reading, I kind of came up with a personal uh, example, which is my stepfather. Um, he kind of, he's like, he's a narcissist. Is that Kevin? Is that Kevin? Yes. <laughs> oh, Kevin. <laughs> so he's kind of a narcissist. Um, he constantly has like this too much confidence in himself, but he's also very controlling and very, like always wants this power. He obviously like always tries to control my mom in every aspect that she does, whether she buys something, whether she goes somewhere, what she's doing at all times. And that kind of goes along with my little brothers as well. He constantly wants to know what they're doing. And if he can't control it, he kind of gets really frustrated and basically complains to my mom, which is why they're kind of like no longer together because he used to complain to my mom about my sister and I because we were the two, the two things he could not control because we weren't necessarily his. I wasn't my, his biological daughters, mm -hmm. but he immediately came to mind when I was reading this. <laughs> he what? He, he immediately came to mind. Yeah, yeah. Your brother wanted to play soccer and he wanted to play baseball, so now he doesn't go to his, his games. What a mini. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. You know, I'm a mom. Um, okay, so I wasn't going to ask if your mother's still married to him because I mean, like, uh, but I guess it sounds good. 
that she's not with them. Um, yeah, that, that seemed pretty bad. Um, if you can think of another example though, Madeline, right? Because, you know, you've already used them <laughs> for something else, uh, but whatever, that's okay. Okay, DT, what do you have? All right, what about you, Lakin? So this also made me think about my dad. Um, he is like an entrepreneur, and so he's very leading in that way. But personally, he he's also very controlling, especially with money, since my mom was a housewife for so long, and she still is. But he always uses money against everyone, and He's always like, remember who pays the phone bill? And yeah. Okay. All right. I think you used that before too. Did you? Anyway, I mean, I do think it's nice for the students in developing countries to know that in America, at a certain level, there's a certain kind of primitive level of archetypes that we're all on the same page and we're all struggling against the same things. We might be a wealthier country and, you know, Lakin's family has a lot more money than a lot of the rest of you, but you still use money as a tool, no matter how much you have, right? That's, that, I think that's an important thing for everyone to realize. Um, Al, so we have one guy here and I was thinking, okay, guy, you tell us about guys, okay? I had him, uh, this one coworker. Um, I used to work at a, at a martial arts school back in Miami. And I had this one coworker that was very, uh, almost fake in a sense that he, he knew how to present to different people to kind of get what he wanted. And um, he didn't seem to enjoy the job itself, but more what came with the job, the sort of power that he had over other people in the job. And over time, he ends up uh, quitting the job and he ends up being very successful doing some businessy sort of quasi multi-level marketing kind of thing. But whatever, it went up well for him. But he ended up leaving because uh, he wasn't the top dog at the uh, at the school and he felt disrespected by that. You know, and he was always talking about how, oh, yeah, he'll come back and show us all what's up because, you know, this and that. But he, his ego just wouldn't let him be under someone else at the gym, you know? And that, that kind of resonated with, uh, with what I read in the, in the chapter, where it's that type of person where uh, he kind of, it's not so much about the value of the thing he's doing, but the power that comes with it, the, um, right. what's the word, the uh, admiration. Like he, he's in it for the admiration and the clout instead of the, uh, the actual love of it. Yeah, Which I think yeah. Yeah, which I think is interesting juxtaposed to uh, to Poseidon because it's talking about how Poseidon type people, uh, it's not so much that they want like a nice, well-paying job as they want a job that is enjoyable to them, you know? That's right. But then they do resent it. Oh, when, yeah. When, when women who are more studious and Polonian, right? I mean, I I just think that's the problem of income disparity because we shouldn't make these people miserable, right? They should be able to find a job like the guys on the grounds crew at Lion where they can, they like that. They wanna be outside all day, right? A gardener or a landscape person. Why do they get paid nothing, you know? And they have to struggle so much. That's what really bothers me is the inequality of income and no health care and housing, you know, all that, why do you punish someone for being themselves and for doing a job that other people want you to do? There's a need for it. Yeah, so that's a, another way that men get stuffed into that Zeus role because the alternatives are, are so awful, right? And everybody's unhappy. <laughs> um, all right, so here's, here's what we've got. I talk too much. But next time, I won't talk very much. Next time, 
We'll start with the people who haven't spoken about Zeus yet. And then I'll summarize Poseidon, uh, Poseidon quickly. And then you'll do a round of Poseidon. And then I'll summarize Hades. And we'll do a round of Hades. And then I'll summarize, I think it's Apollo. Okay, we'll just try to get through that. And we'll just keep going. Um, so I'm sorry, I talked a lot, but I do, I, in the back of my mind, I thought, okay, you know, he, this is the kind of the, some of the bigger picture stuff I want you to be thinking about. And we can get through that other stuff. We just can't necessarily get through it exactly this day, but we'll, we will catch up. Um, so office hours, I'm going to start. I have my usual office hours to meet with you about your papers. Um, the papers are not due. Um, when are they due? Um, oh, they're due next Friday. Um, so I will have office hours at my usual 8 to 10 p.m. But I'll also have some office hours in the, in the morning, but not on Monday or Tuesday. On Wednesday and Thursday, I can have those office hours late at night for the students that don't get electricity. Um, Professor, uh, when you have the office hour, that time I have the class. That's why I wait, cannot wait, join. Wait, wait, Poppy, just a sec. I got to let everybody else go who doesn't need to talk to me because they have classes. And then, Poppy, I'll talk to you. That's fine. Okay, Poppy, go ahead. Yeah, Professor, when you have the office hour time, and that time I have the class always, that's why I cannot join the office hour. That's okay. You could just tell me, do you have a class at 11 o'clock? Uh, uh, till 11.30, I have the class. Okay, well, I can meet with you at 11.30. Which day of the week would you like? <clears throat> Okay, I will send you the email, Professor. It will be better. Yeah, okay. I can meet. I usually stay up till midnight. So that's not a problem. Okay. Okay. Anybody Thank you. Else? Yeah, sure. Someone else want to talk to me about uh, office hour appointment? Or yes, Professor. This is Fahima talking. Okay, Fahima. A uh, professor, I couldn't uh, make that appointment yesterday because I think it's, it was due to internet connection. Okay. Uh, I really need an appointment. Okay. Um, uh, which, which time of day works for you? Um, so, Professor, if it's uh, right after the class, it will be okay because I don't have um, a CS50 class today. Okay. Do you want it after class right now or do you want it after class on Tuesday? T today, Professor. Okay. I'll wait. I haven't read your paper yet, but today. we can go over it. Yep. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Professor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Professor, me too need like all uh, office hour today, like just after the class itself. Okay, I so. Have, I have a few questions to ask. Okay, well, first Fahima and then Bondono. What about Jareen? Are you there? Okay, what about Elizabeth? Are you there, Elizabeth? Okay, so Fahima, what would you like? You um, um Professor, I want to talk about my um six week uh, weekly post of the week. Six. You have okay. rated me very low, uh, um, and you have mentioned it's because of my writing uh, pattern. Uh, 
Yeah, and um, I think that um, before writing a week six weekly post, I wrote it like other weeks, and I didn't know that I have to be more careful about this. Uh, and uh, now that you have mentioned that after this you are going to cut marks from writing pattern grammar and e like we need to try our best to write better so of course i am going to try my best but please uh, reconsider my week six post because you didn't mention at the first you mentioned that you are going to think again uh, uh, read about the ideas that how we relate and how we right. write the examples about the qualities of our ideas not from the grammatic uh, grammar point or the writing pattern uh, so, so yeah and you have mentioned that my my example that you have from my writing okay so let's see so i mean you were doing fine so it was the post six was lower right um it wasn't super low it was just lower see uh, uh, like oh. in the class okay sorry uh Okay, so Fahim. Um, all right, so you can. Um, so why don't you rewrite it, right? Um, and just work on the grammar and you can post it again. Um, it's not going to make that a huge difference in terms of your overall grade. And then I don't have a grade for you on post number five, but I might not have recorded it. Did you hand in number five? Yes, process. Okay. So I have um, I have got my grade for week uh, four, five, and also week six. Uh, do you want me to repost it again, my week six post? Um, you can re. re you I, know, I got you disconnected. Sorry. I that's okay. It's not your fault. That's what I was, you know. That's always true. So yeah, why don't you rewrite it and repost it, and that'll be fine. Hmm. Okay, okay, professor. Of course. So you think that it, there won't be any huge difference for my grade? Well, the grade will go up some, sure. Okay. Okay, professor. Sure. Uh, professor. <clears throat> Can I uh, repost it during spring break? <laughs> during because spring break? Um, yeah. Now I'm working term paper, not so right. I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, that's okay. Yes. You can repost it later. Um, the big problem is for how, to, how I can know, you know, because I, anyway. You can repost it and then you can send me a message that you reposted it. That's fine. Oh, okay, Professor. Thank you so much. Of and, course. And, and I, I, I wanted to ask about the midterm paper. Like um, when I saw the rubric that you had, you had sent for the midterm paper, it, it, it seems so complex for me um uh, we actually have to uh, relate our personal life and how our personality uh, is connected with the goddesses or obsessed with the goddesses uh, we have to write examples and bring examples of our life history like this professor we have to go on in, with our return paper okay so the assignment said you have a thesis statement you say okay i'm i think i'm mostly this and then you, yeah, you have, okay, what's my evidence? Well, when I was a child, this, and when I was um, in, you know, middle school, adolescence, this, right? You just go through all the phases. You can um, give an example of some watershed event, right? Now, then you, then you have to say, well, actually it was a mix of, you know, then when I got to a certain age, something else, I started to become more assertive or I started to become more creative, whatever. And then you think about, well, what's my weakness? Um, does that follow the type? Is that this is the type of weakness this type of person has and I'm going to have to correct for that, right? Does that make sense? 
Yeah. So do we have to start from our childhood and, and also like and right with that how we get older we become we become well like, I don't I mean no why would I I mean yeah you you should start with your childhood because that's Absolutely. how we've, as we've read everything you know everything we yeah like that so let's do it okay let's see I'm trying to Professor, Professor. got it thank you sure. Prof uh, um, sure, fine. Professor, uh, like, uh, like I was asking same about the assignment. Like, we have to write thousand notes. So, like, uh, we have to write about the goddess uh, connected with our or like the means like life of the people uh, in public. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I think I've said this many times, but it's uh, exactly you know it's what we've been doing with every goddess. Just you do it with your. Uh, Right. Yeah, yeah, professor. Like we, uh, we will pick out one goddess or like, uh, like the goddess. Like there were six or seven well, it goddesses. It depends on who you are, Bondona. I cannot tell you who you are. If you, no. if you, after you've studied it, you think, well, I'm actually a combination of this one and this one, right? Yeah. Professor, we should like write uh, in this type in this stage of my life. I was like this goddess, right. and then this uh, type uh, stage of my life, I was like more like this goddess. Uh, I think we should write like this, Bondona. Right, and then you have to explain why. Like, why did you change? You have to, right? I mean, I, I, you can't just say, okay, I was like Hestia, and then. I went to kindergarten and I became like Athena and then I went to sixth grade. I mean, you have to explain this, like, right? You have to, yeah, you have to tell me a story. Oh, okay, professor. Professor, and uh, like, uh, like I was uh, talking about like post three, you gave you about Astemia uh, and the four ducks. Like, uh, I know that Astemia goddess is the goddess of uh religions uh wild animal hunt and uh, he was means like uh, the goddess of fertility so like uh, and there was a question mentioned the four ducks uh, what does it mean means i am unable to write i'm stuck with that the four ducks and astemia like oh well did you read the chapter about the four tasks Yes, professor. I went through it, uh, like, and I went through your video, but like, I was unable to like uh, understand it. Uh, can you give it Hi. just a hint, like? Hi. No, no. Okay, I understand the video wasn't that clear, but the chapter, yeah. right? You read the chapter. Yeah. Okay, so the chapter has first you sort the seeds, right? Yeah. So that's what you're actually doing when you're thinking about what was I like in childhood? What did my mother say? You know, that's sorting the seeds all the way through. Like, how was my relationship with my siblings or my parents? How did that, like, naturally, I'm not assertive, but my dad picked on me so much that I became more argumentative, something like that, right? I don't. Yes, Professor. Whatever it is that really explains who you are. So the four seeds, that's the seeds. And then how did you, you have to, how did you get to the point where you, you applied for scholarships and now you're concerned, you want to have a career, you want to be able to function in the adult world as independently, right? So you've made these moves to start on an independent, uh, professional life. That's number two, is you get the, the wool of the plant, right? And then um, number three is, okay, so, so far I've explained how I've been formed related, re, uh, relative to the family I grew up in, to the friends I had, to the school I went to, but now I'm working my way at my own um, my own public uh, profession. But I also have to think about what is it that I really like the most, right? What is it I really feel at home doing? That's the clear water. 
Um, and then learning how to be more spontaneous uh, because all of this other stuff is just thinking all the time. But so does that make sense, Bondona? Yes, Professor. Okay. Uh, yes, Professor. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Sure. No problem. Professor, is there any word limit for uh, week seven? No, post? no there's, I, I mean, no, because I think it could get really long. I can't imagine that it's going to, that the students are going to have one that's really short. Yeah, so it's, there's no word limit. I'll read anything, but, but you should write, you know, make sure you write well. That's important. Okay, sure, Professor. Professor, happy International Omen Day. Omen's Day. Happy International Omen Day. You can write it in the chat. I'm not I'm not quite sure what you're okay, 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 okay. Professor, she is saying happy International Women oh, Day. Oh. Okay, good. Actually, I need to bring that up, Bondona. Remind me of that, okay? Okay, Professor. Yeah. Like wishing you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Of course. Okay. I'll write that okay. down. International Women's Day. Very good. Okay, I'll write that down. All right, anything else? No, Professor. No, okay. Professor. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Good, Good, night. Thank Good you. night. Good night. Um, okay, so I should check again. <laughs>